Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome. I am Professor Jill Castle, the Chief of Protocol of the George Washington University. And on behalf of my colleagues who are here with me this afternoon, <laughs> my colleagues across the university, I am delighted to welcome all of you to this very special ceremony as we honor His Excellency, the Prime Minister of Kuwait with the George Washington University President's Medal. Your Highness, we're delighted to have you with us this afternoon. To begin our ceremony, <laughs> to begin our ceremony, it's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, Ambassador Edward W. Ganim, known to all as Skip. As you know, Ambassador Ganim is the Kuwait professor at George Washington University, and most importantly, he is the former ambassador from the United States to the state of Kuwait. Ladies and gentlemen, Skip Ganim. Thank, thank you, uh, Marshall. Uh, it's, it is, uh, Your Highness, a great pleasure today to welcome you uh, to the Middle East Policy Forum. And you know that that welcome is not just as, my, as a director, but as a personal friend. And you know how I've dreamed of this day and said to you every time I saw you in Kuwait the last few years, you've got to come to Washington and you've got to come to George Washington University. So I thank you uh, personally for, for your doing so today. I also want to give a special welcome to uh, uh, my friend, the ambassador of the state of Kuwait, Sheikh uh, Salim uh, Abdullah Al Sabah. It's nice to have you with us today. Uh, I would also like to welcome and to introduce to you all uh, the d very distinguished uh, members of the uh, Prime Minister's delegation. Uh, His Ex uh, Excellency Abdurrahman al Atiji, who is here in the front, he was the first Kuwaiti ambassador to the United States when Kuwait became independent in 1962. And far more important to me, you know, sir, you're my friend, and we had wonderful times and conversations together, and I know how you've worked through your entire life to maintain the strong relationship that we have between our two countries. And uh, His Excellency uh, Sheikh Dr. Mohammed Sabah Salim Sabah, uh, another dear friend, but if I keep saying that all day, we won't get to the program. Uh, he, uh, he served eight years as the Kuwaiti ambassador in Washington. And um, I, I would tell you, since we're in the world of academia, I think he will let me say this. He loved when he was a professor. And he often likes to say, that was what I really loved doing, but uh, he, he is a great, great friend, and thank you for being here today. Also, um, other members of the delegation, His Excellency Ismail Shati, uh, advisor in the Diwan of His Highness the Prime Minister, uh, His Excellency Mustafa Shamali, the Minister of Finance, it's wonderful to have you with us today, sir. His Excellency Sheikh Ibrahim Duaj Al Sabah, He's not here. Oh, that's too bad because I had a story about him as well. But I'll, say, I'll, say, I'll save that one. His Excellency Salam al Jabr al Sabah, advisor in the Diwan of His, uh, of his Highness uh, the Prime Minister. Uh, Khalid Suleiman al Jarralla, who is Undersecretary in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and someone I worked very closely with for many years. And His Excellency Khalid Ahmed al Banai, Undersecretary in the Diwan of His Highness the Prime Minister, and Ali Hussein al Samak the director of the Department of the Americas in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So please join with me in, in welcoming all of these people with us today. <laughs> and I would also like to take this one moment, just one more moment uh, to recognize Mr. Oliver Zandona. Ali, I know you're here, but I'm not sure. There he is right here. And I want to just say to all of you and to Ali in front of all of you how much we appreciate the very generous support of ExxonMobil. Uh, he is from their office here in Washington because they have been generous in giving a grant to our Middle East policy. Program. 
And now it's a great pleasure, and I'm very pleased to introduce the Dean of the Elliott School of International Affairs, Dean Michael Brown. Skip, thank you very much indeed. Your Highness, Excellencies, and distinguished guests, I join the President of the University, Ambassador Ghanim, and Professor Castle in welcoming all of you to the Elliott School of International Affairs in the campus of the George Washington University. We are very proud of the Elliott School and its 2,900 students, American and international students uh, from around the world who are all deeply interested in the challenges of the international arena. Uh, here at the Elliott School, we are particularly pleased with the establishment of our new Institute for Middle East Studies, headed by our distinguished colleague and also a friend of Kuwait, Professor Nathan Brown. It's been one of our uh, priorities here at the Elliott School over the past couple of years to expand our programs uh, and faculty in Middle East Studies, and we're very pleased to have made such tremendous progress over the past couple of years. We're especially grateful, Your Highness, for the special relationship that our school has with Kuwait through the endowment of the Kuwait Chair of Gulf and Arabian Peninsula Affairs, and of course, with the holder of that prestigious professorship, Ambassador Ghanim. I was very pleased to accompany Ambassador Ghanim and Professor Nathan Brown on a visit to Kuwait last year, and I deeply appreciate your hospitality when you invited us to, your, to join your family for lunch at your residence. We are honored to have you with us today. Uh, I would now like to introduce the president of the George Washington University, Dr. Stephen Knapp. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Dean Brown, Your Highness, Excellencies, friends, distinguished guests. Your Highness, it's a distinct honor to welcome you to the George Washington University. This university, located in the heart of our nation's capital, was founded on the dream of our first president, George Washington, that there would be an institution of learning in our capital that would prepare American students for service to the nation and to the world. One of the premier schools within the university is the Elliott School of International Affairs, where we teach our students to be leaders throughout the world. I wish to thank you and through you, His Highness the Emir, for the support that Kuwait has given to the Elliott School, and specifically, the endowment of the Kuwait Chair. We also recall that His Highness the Emir visited the George Washington University and received an honorary doctorate of law in 2005. So we are proud to call His Highness an alumnus of this university, in fact, among the very distinguished alumni of this university. I am also pleased to mention that two other schools in the university, the School of Engineering and Applied Science and the School of Business, have memoranda of understanding with Kuwait to facilitate the admission of Kuwaiti students to the university. Our law school has also had collaborative programs with the University of Kuwait. These ties are very meaningful to us. They are, we believe, mutually beneficial to Kuwait and to the university. We very much hope that we can expand our ties and to deepen our relationship in meaningful ways. I hope to be able to visit Kuwait in the not too distant future to further our friendship. And Your Highness, I thank you personally for uh, re-emphasizing re that invitation as we spoke earlier today. And on a personal level, let me say that as I'm just starting my second year as the president of this university, this is my very first President's Medal Ceremony. Accordingly, I'm particularly pleased to have the honor to bestow my first President's Medal on Your Highness in tribute to your long service to your country and to the people of Kuwait. Would you please join me at the podium, sir? What I'd like to do now is to read the citation and then confer the President's Medal. To His Highness, the Prime Minister, Sheikh Nasser Mohammed Al Ahmed Al Jaber Al Sabah, in this first decade of a new millennium, the world faces serious challenges such as global hostilities, border disputes, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and terrorism. No country understands an uncertain world more than the state of Kuwait, a country that has suffered aggression and occupation but refused to accept submission. 
Kuwaitis fought steadfastly in a coalition to liberate their country and then worked resolutely to rebuild their country for the benefit of all its citizens. Beyond its own borders, Kuwait has been a partner in fighting the forces in this world that would undermine peace, security, and prosperity. You, Sheikh Nasser, have been a leader in these efforts. Your Highness, you have given your country a lifetime of service, commencing with the appointment as your nation's first ambassador to the United Nations office in Geneva. You were later appointed Kuwait's ambassador to Iran, where you became dean of the diplomatic corps. Answering the call of the Emir of Kuwait, you held several ministerial positions in the Kuwaiti government, including Minister of Information, Minister of Social Affairs and Labor, and Minister of State for Foreign Affairs. You then served as Minister of Amiri Dawan Affairs for the late Amir Sheikh Jabir al Sabah, in essence, the Emir's minister, remaining faithfully at his side for over 15 years. Following his accession in 2006, his Highness the Emir Sheikh Sabah al Ahmed al Jabbar al Sabah asked that you serve the state of Kuwait as its Prime Minister. In this capacity, you have led your government with fortitude and determination at a time of considerable turmoil and uncertainty in the region. Your devotion to and concern for your country and its people are a testimonial to your high character and deep sense of responsibility. One moment in time underscores your love of and devotion to your country. In the dark days after the Iraqi aggression in 1990, you were the first voice of Kuwait on the radio, a clarion call for the cause of liberation. Kuwaitis scattered abroad and under occupation heard your voice and knew that hope and determination would prevail. For your lifetime of service to your nation and your people, the George Washington University hereby bestows upon you the President's Medal with all the rights, duties, privileges, and responsibilities pertaining thereto. I shall grab the medal. And, uh, congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. President Knapp, faculty members, distinguished guests, and the students, thank you and thank you for your warm welcome. President Knapp, thank you very much for your generous gesture in awarding me the President's Medal. I have the pleasure to receive this distinguished medal, especially since our Head of State, His Highness Sheikh Sabah Al Ahmed Al Sabah, received his honorary PhD from this distinguished institution three years ago. I also have the pleasure to be here be today to talk with you about the historic relationship between our two peoples, a relationship which has endured more than 100 years and was ultimately tested over 18 years ago when Saddam Hussein invaded and occupied my country. I want personally to extend to you the deep gratitude of the government and the people of Kuwait for the special role you, your government, and especially the young men and women in your armed forces played in 1991 when they were called upon to help save the people 
of a small nation far from home from the brutal aggression of a ruthless neighbor. The relationship between the United States and of America and Kuwait has grown tremendously and withstood much since 1951 when an American consulate was first opened in Kuwait. Ten years later, when Kuwait became independent in June 1961, the consulate became the first American embassy. <coughs> At that time, in, in our early years of independence, the United Kingdom was Kuwait's most important ally. So, when we faced our first major foreign policy problem arising from Abdul Karim Qasim of Iraq, claims to Kuwait territory, the British responded to the Emir's request for assistance to prevent an Iraqi invasion. The United Nations also supported Kuwait's sovereignty. Ultimately, the British troops were replaced by the Arab League forces until 1963 when they were asked to withdraw. During the years of 1961 and 1980, our countries conducted normal relation, primarily focused on commercial and energy cooperation with a modest bilateral military assistance program. During those years, Kuwait sought to maintain a balance in its foreign policy with regards to the West, the then also to the Soviet Union and its neighbors. As a member of the Arab League, which had supported us in our hour of need, we often took positions we deemed to be in, in our interest, which Washington did not always find helpful, including our support for the PLO against Israel's occupation of Arab land and our participation in the Arab oil boycott in 1967 and 1973. However, Kuwait also maintained its relationship with Washington throughout this period over the objections of a number of Arab states. Our security relationship began to deepen in 1980 as a result of the Iran-Iraq war, which lasted eight years. Eleven of our super tankers were allowed to fly the American flag and be placed under the protection of the U.S. Navy. The reflagging effort, known as the Operation Ernest Will, began in January 1987 with the financial support from our government. Operation Ernest Will would mark the beginning of our strategic partnership between the United States and Kuwait. And a strengthening of our bilateral relation, which ultimately was tested a few years later when on August the 2nd, 1990, Saddam Hussein invaded and occupied my country. Through the tireless effort of the 41st president, of the United States, Mr. George Bush, and his government. The historical multinational coalition was assembled under United Nations auspices. The coalition undertook a major military campaign, Operation Desert Storm, which ultimately liberated Kuwait. Kuwait's Air Force proudly participated in that coalition, flying its fighters from bases in the, in, the United, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Kuwait 
has not been idle since its liberation 18 years ago. U.S. Kuwait security ties, which were formalized in 1992 in a defense cooperation agreement, have grown stronger and deeper in the post-Gulf War period. Kuwait United States worked throughout the 1990 to monitor and enforce Saddam Hussein's compliance with United Nations Security Council, all resolutions. And when diplomacy and sanctions failed, Kuwait provided the main platform for the U.S. forces for Operation Iraqi Freedom 2003. Kuwait has also worked with the U.S. to build its own defense capability, acquiring over $8 billion of U.S. military and technical assistances, including Patriot missiles, <coughs> F-18 fighters, M1A2 tanks, Apache helicopters, and U.S. Navy vessels. These systems give our armed forces the ability to operate with the U.S. forces in the event we should ever have to confront a common enemy again. In order to prepare for, the, for that possibility, we also are engaged in a formal security dialogue with the senior United States government officials in order to define data and ultimately defend against regional threats, including international terrorism. As a proactive partner in the U.S.-led campaign against global terrorism, we are providing military, diplomatic, and intelligent assistance, as well as supporting efforts to block the financing of terrorist groups. Kuwait has resumed its role in regional diplomacy. We are active and strong allies of the United States. In the global war on terror, we also are in the close consultation with the U.S. and our neighbors in considering new threats that merge in the Gulf region and beyond. And another critical part of our regional role is to develop a new relationship with the new Iraq. Obviously, we are closely watching the developments there, and we also look forward to the return of our ambassador to Baghdad, who was sworn in in last Tuesday, 16th of September, and to welcoming an Iraqi ambassador in Kuwait. For Kuwait, like everyone else, the impact was not only felt in our territory, but throughout the Middle East and the rest of the world. For that reason, we will continue to do our part to support effort of the United States and the Iraqi government to stabilize the situation there and lay the groundwork of an Iraq which can be a full contributor to stability, peace, and prosperity in the Gulf and in the Middle East. Regional crisis and tensions also have pointed out the stark reality that the world has grown more dependent on the vital oil of resources in the Gulf region. And this dependence is likely to continue into the foreseeable future, since almost 47% of the world's proven oil reserves lies underneath the sands of the Arabian Peninsula. What this means is the need for a closer cooperation between the producer and the consumer nations to avert future disruption of the oil supply and their economic consequences. Because 
of the constant focus on security problems in the Gulf, very little is known about the solid trade relations that exist between the United States and the Arab Gulf states. The GCC, which is Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, and Oman, is America's sixth largest trading partner. For several years, in the past decade, it was the GCC region alone among all the other major trade areas in the world where America annually has had an overall trade surplus. After the war in 1991, on the domestic front, we did not just restore the country to what it was before, especially we revived our parliamentary democracy. Kuwait's politics have always been very active and vibrant with all the pluses and minuses that it brings. Our succession process in 2006 was unprecedented and was commended internationally as a process to be emulated. Since 2005, Kuwaiti women have the right to vote and are serving as cabinet minister with a place in parliament where we hope to have a woman elected one day soon. With these successes, we have become a model of political progress and democracy for the Middle East and the Arab world. Also, Kuwait has adopted free enterprise as a model for our economic future. We have placed increased emphasis on the private sector to achieve sustained economic growth of our people. We are ag aggressively pursuing U.S. business participation in technology, products, and services. Beyond the threat of a global terrorism, there are other persistent problems which threaten global peace and stability and which need to be engaged before it is too late. Issues like helping emerging nations get through their difficult transition, improving the quality of life in poor nations, creating stable energy and trade markets, finding solutions to environmental issues like global warming and climate change. In this effort, some nations will be able to contribute manpower and expert and other financial resources. But only one country can, can, can contribute the key ingredient, the leadership, since it's necessary to make this effort a global success. And that country is the United States of America. For this country, your country, has been endowed with un unique and valuable resources. The most precious one being the will and generous spirit of its people. That is what America and Americans are all about. For you, the students of Elliott School of International Affairs, as you venture out to pursue careers in the international policy or economics, you will find that the world has grown smaller and more independent, and that an awareness of issues abroad is as important as those at home. But most importantly, you will have the chance to contribute in resolving these difficult issues 
and influence the direction the new world order is taking. So again, Mr. President, I thank you for asking me to be here today. And no matter what field you pursue in your international studies, I hope it will bring you to Kuwait, <laughs> where you will be all welcomed, warmly received by the many friends that you have yet to meet there. Thank you. His Highness has uh, graciously uh, offered to take a, a few questions. We have a little bit of time here. Uh, now you've, you've met the nice guy. I'm the bad guy. <laughs> I'm going to monitor this. He's I the would, good guy. <laughs> I, I would encourage you, if you have a question, if you raise your hand, we have microphones yes. which we yes. brought to you. Make the question short, quick, and have a question mark at the end. <laughs> and I reserve the right to cut off anything that goes beyond what I think is correct. All right? So, first question, here. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, the UAE, United Arab Emirates, has done a lot to change their economy because of the limitations of oil in the future. It's a limited resource. They've converted to tourism as a major source of income. Uh, are there any plans in the future of Kuwait to do anything like this to change your economy because of the limitation of oil? I think we apply the international law. We apply what the laws against terrorism is. While the OA or the GCC members, we are all alike. And we follow the same policy. Um, how did you choose your topic of discussion when to address the students here at GW today? <laughs> That's tomorrow, not today. <laughs> how did you uh, yeah. choose yeah. the subject that you spoke about today, or why? That will be tomorrow, and you will hear about it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> here in the center. The U.S. financial markets have been going crazy the last few days. Um, has Kuwait had uh, very much money invested in the markets? And if so, if they've lost a lot, will that have domestic repercussions um, on, on the United States or the image of the United States? We are in the same boat as you are. <laughs> the financial situation is not only in America. It's all over the world. We know how much has touched America, which is the most from all the world. We are here since 50 and 60 years with our investments. And we are going ahead what we can do. But I can assure you that we are also in the same boat as you. Uh, I see a hand way back in the right corner. Hello, Your Excellency. Uh, my name is Jehan Harney, and uh, I'm with Iran VNC. And on a personal note for today, actually, I'm really glad that you're here because um, there's a piece of Kuwait here, and actually, I'm born and raised there. So it's nice to see you here. And. Um, I have uh, two uh, quick questions for you. Please. Um, I'm interested in uh, Iran. So uh, w what is Kuwait doing exactly now with Iran regarding the nuclear standoff with the West and with the IAEA? 
and what it should do in case of any imminent attack on Iran. Should it close the Straits of Hormuz? Iran is a neighbor to us and a friend to us. We want peace. We have advised our friends, the Iranians, that the only solution actually is peace. It is time that the West and the Iranians sit together and start talking peace. I think we have a great chance that we have a common friend, Dr. Baraidi in Vienna, a very respectable international figure that can play for both sides on a very peaceful solutions. We believe in peace, we want peace, and nothing like peace. War, one minute of war is a disaster. We want to avoid that. And that's why we have been talking to all our friends that it is vital to sit and talk. And don't expect that in one or two or three time you would solve it. Not at all. You need time. But by the time you sit and you discuss and you talk, you will arrive. And I am really optimist about that. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, time for one more question. Um, Adi, and then, well, two. Yeah. Of course. Thank you very much for coming to see us. A uh, very short question. How do you see the future of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? We hope, we hope peace will take its place. And we are glad that now the process is going on with all the neighbors in the area. And we hope that even the, our friends, the Turks, can play a big role and then took ahead for a peace talk. The Palestinians, they are a part of us, and we hope that we will see independent state soon. Nothing like peace. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Last question. Your Highness, thank you so much for gracing us so with your presence today and your words. Um, my question is a little simpler. You spoke eloquently about the long relationship between the United States and your country, as well as the long and, we hope, growing relationship with George Washington University. What can George Washington University do to further expand and continue that wonderful relationship? Yeah. Well, George Washington University has a very good ambassador to us <laughs> and to the people of Kuwait. Skip good name. <laughs> We support George Washington University. We are proud to be here. And we hope you'll have the pleasure to have the president and Mr. Gunaim and all the others to visit us soon. That way we'll have more talks and more cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you. At this point in time, I want to introduce a student who will have her comments to thank. But as she comes up, I did forget to mention one very, very important person for us today, Her Excellency, the American Ambassador in Kuwait, Deborah Jones, a good friend of mine as well. And Deborah, thank you very much for being here today. And Hannah Bayan. <laughs> Hannah Bayan, one of our distinguished students. Last word. Mm -hmm. It is my pleasure on behalf of all the students at the Elliott School to thank the Prime Minister and his delegation for visiting the George Washington University today. As a student here at the Elliott School of International Affairs, I have had the great privilege of studying Middle Eastern politics and international dynamics with experts including Ambassador Ghanim. Through courses like the Ambassadors and, excuse me, I gained a tremendous appreciation for the politics, law, economy, and rich history of this region. Today's visit from His Excellency brings to life many of the issues that we have studied 
and, like the best seminar teachers, the Prime Minister has further enhanced my study of the region. His continued dedication, along with the Kuwaiti people, to the universal goal of education is both exemplary and crucial for our world's future. The continued support of education and cross-cultural understanding will be fundamentals for furthering and maintaining peaceful, constructive relations across the varied regions of our world. Today's dialogue is just one example of why so many of us, as both students of international affairs and citizens of an increasingly globalized world, are optimistic about the future. Again, thank you for joining us today and for your ongoing commitment to public service. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so very much for being here this afternoon. I should tell you that Ambassador Ghanim worked so hard to teach me the following phrase in Arabic. Your Highness, Nashkurkum Kathir. I have a wonderful teacher, believe me, in Skip Ghanim. Thank you all. Good afternoon. Ah, would, would, the, would you all remain seated for a moment until the delegation has left the room? Thank you. Ah, thank you. Thank you, my fellow faculty member. My fellow faculty member.